So today I'm uh, going to talk about this book, Atta, by an author called Jared Kobeck. Um, he was not an author I'd even heard of until about a week ago when I was watching a YouTube video of uh, the author Ian Sinclair and the stand-up comedian Stuart Lee discussing him as an important writer. So I thought, oh, I'd better go and check that out because uh, as uh, regular viewers will know, uh, my esteem for Stuart Lee uh, knows no bounds. So uh, if he's all right by Stuart Lee, then he's all right by me. Um, and just as a, a aside, um, so I, having read this book, I then went and checked out some YouTube uh, interviews with Kobeck himself, and here he name checks the importance of Stuart Lee. So it's uh, <laughs> all very incestuous. But anyway, um, and if you don't know who Atta is, Mohammed Atta was the uh, the ringleader of the actual uh, pilots who flew into the Twin Towers. He wasn't the guy who planned it, uh, obviously, but uh, he was the man charged with authority of organising them uh, on the ground uh, and was one of the few of the 15 to have actually gone and, and met with Bin Laden himself. So... Um, this book, I think, is um, it gets you inside the mind of Mohammed Atta. It's 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 utterly credible as to this is how this guy felt and why he was driven to do what he did. Obviously, we don't really know, and we'll never know. But this is a really good sort of um, literary sort of theorising. I don't mean it's a theoretical book, but um, of the ideas that uh, propelled this man to do what he did. Uh, and it's research heavy, but it wears it so effortlessly through its literary style that it's not just dry and, and everything. This is a genuine character brought to life by Kobeck, and it's a remarkable achievement. It reminded me of um, two other texts. One is Kafka's letter to his father. The other is David Peace's book, The Damned United. Um, Kafka's letter to his father... Uh, which he never sent because uh, he was too much of a coward, uh, which is kind of what the letter was about. It was about how his dad had dominated him and sort of broken him, really. Um, sort of made him feel sort of shame and humiliation throughout his life because his dad was so powerful. Um, and Atta's dad is, is, has the same effect on, on Atta, but the difference is that Kafka basically sort of was aware of it and sort of thought very heavily about what its implications were. A lot of Kafka's writing uh, starts from the body, so there's uh, the wound described in uh, a country, the short story A Country Doctor. There's the wound in the metamorphosis when uh, uh, an apple has been thrown at the bug and has sort of lodged there and sort of got all sort of septic and stuff. Um, but there's also his choice of, of sort of human sort of anthropomorphizing of a mole, blind mole underground uh, in the burrow or, or the bug in the metamorphosis. So Kafka is very aware and exploring the, the body that he, in his own case, plus of course he had tuberculosis, so his own body was sort of fragile anyway, but his body, he felt emasculated by his father, who was a big, powerful man. And Atta is, is exactly the, the same, uh, but he has a very different response. Um, he doesn't sort of try and sort of place it in the world and understand it. Instead, he is, tries to cut himself off from the body and all things flesh. And to do that, other things have to suffer. So that's, that's, the, that's the first comparison I'd make. The second is to The Damned United by David Peace, which is a, a book that takes you right inside the mind of a fictional version of the uh, football manager, Brian Clough. And that's a book about sort of obsessively going over the same sort of failings and neuroses and anxieties over and over and over again. Atta's is different. It takes you inside the mind to the same level, but it, it doesn't sort of replay and go over and over and over. It just builds up the different areas that eventually come together to, to, to sort of bring this guy into flying the uh, plane into the, into the Twin Towers. So... The level of sort of insight into into a human psyche is, is similar to the Damned United, but the mechanism of getting there is 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 very different. So those are the two sort of texts that I sort of um, preface the, the the book with. Okay, so the book itself, it's um, it's not easy reading. It's not pleasant reading because you know where this ends up. But if you can bring yourself to to read this subject matter. I would say read this because like the peace book 
there aren't many books that really get you inside a, a, a person's head to the degree and the believability, the credibility that, that this does. And I think that's a remarkable achievement, especially because you don't like this guy. He's full of, of sort of disgust and hatred and prejudice. So it's not a likeable character. Uh, almost no stage is it likeable. Uh, and yet some of the, uh, the reasoning of this guy you can understand. Um, so, for example, he has. He's not. He doesn't start off as a sort of fundamental fundamentalist at all. He's brought up in a middle class Egyptian family, uh, which is an interesting study because, at that time and possibly still now, I don't know. In Egypt, there was a glass ceiling. Obviously, you had the people at the bottom of society, but then you had the middle class, of which Atta's family was one, but. They use sort of influence and payola and sort of bribing officials. It would only get them so far because they were not of that class of officials and, and, and the sort of the governing classes who are the ones who got the payments. So it's middle class, but it's never going to be upper echelons. It's definitely sort of fixed. And Atta hates that in his father. He hates the, the fact that he's not religious, that he plays the society game. But he also hates the fact that you have to play that sort of society game because when Atta goes off to study in Germany, even though he hates everything about the West and its decadence and its sort of immorality, the one thing he likes about where he is in Hamburg at the university is that, you know, you don't have to pay officials in order to get access or, or, or in order to sort of go ahead. It is He uses the word egalitarian uh, because he would never use the word democratic because he, he hates all things that are democracy. So, and that sort of sets up the book because there's so many conflicts. He's so conflicted. You know, all the time he's driving for this sense of purity and everything outside and external and around him is a threat to that. So, for example, um, he goes on, he's invited around to this uh, Palestinian woman's house in, I think in Germany, I can't remember now, I think it's in Germany, or it might be in, in Syria, but anyway... Um, and she's really nice and she really likes him and she invites him back the next evening it's chaperone so her far her parents are there um and he just he, he doesn't go there it's you know it's too much of a <laughs> too much of a good thing it's too appalling to him to to sort of have that sort of uh chance of, of a normal relationship with a woman uh, one assumes that he dies a virgin um and yet on the other hand he has this sort of inner hum all the time which, you know, may be a sort of schizophrenic thing or a sort of existentialist thing. But very occasionally it talks to him and he's sort of compelled. He's sort of uh, in Hamburg and he's compelled to sort of... He's standing outside this sort of shop of, of, of women's makeup and perfumes and he's looking through the window and he's compelled to go in and buy some rouge uh, makeup. Um, and at some point soon after, he puts it on. He's looking at the bathroom mirror with this this makeup on and again it's that sort of conflict of everything he hates and yet he's sort of compelled just to sort of put his toe in the water and just touch it just see what it's like um there's a fantastic thing throughout the book about his relationship with disney so he's exposed to a disney cartoon doesn't get to see the end of it because of whatever's happening you know in the room at that time but then feels compelled because it's so so sort of appalling to him this sort of you know this sort of uh, decadence and 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 the, the fact that it's Jungle Book and the fact that these uh, these sort of animals are anthropomorphised into men, you know, that sort of seems to be blurring the boundaries. And so, at some point, when he's in America, which is in the lead up to when he's going to commit the the nine eleven atrocity, he goes to he goes and visits Disneyland of his own volition, you know, um, and it sort of reaffirms his sort of uh, hatred of 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 what Disney stands for, which to him is American imperialism, it's exporting of American values, um, which is something I can entirely understand, but it doesn't make me want to go and fly a plane uh, and kill lots of innocent people. Um, then a very, very sort of, almost sort of in passing bit is he's in Hamburg, he's sort of wrestling with the sort of the immorality of, of the Reaper Barn in Hamburg and all of that. So he doesn't like Europe. 
but there's a respect for it because it's not Egypt, it's not corrupt and, and all of that. But then Srebrenica, which is the massacre in Bosnia of, of Muslim women and children, and the war in Chechnya, which is the Russian war on, on the Muslims uh, there, make him realise that, you know, Europe was supposedly this sort of civilised, um, you know, sort of decent values society. And these are two instances where it's absolutely not. And it's part of the American-Israeli conspiracy in his mind to sort of... Uh, basically kill all muslims so that's another little incremental uh step on 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 his journey he also makes hajj where he goes and visits uh the holy site of mecca and that is brilliantly described in that for him it's the real turning point it's when he does obviously you know he comes back from that and he he does sort of turn towards more sort of fundamentalist ideas but what's what the description of it is is just how difficult physically difficult and threatening it is because you have this massive humanity and you can be crushed and the smell and the heat and all of that is so sort of overwhelming that you think you're going to die and you think well how is this sort of you know how is this sort of holy but in you know through strength of will you know he's he like everyone else uh you know you come through it and you come through it all the stronger and you see that that massive humanity all doing the same thing when the prayers strike up in unison it's just it must be an overwhelming um sort of uplifting sensation and he realizes that god is love because you know you think i'm going to die i'm going to die but no you're saved you're saved in a situation where all these people are doing the same thing and you sort of raise up and and he he's really come to see that god is love which obviously is <laughs> is again the conflict comes in because late you know once he's in america and he's in charge of keeping these other 14 guys in line and you know he doesn't like the saudis because they're basically peasants and yokels and uh, and sort of you know nomad farmers and yet he sort of is aware that he is a sort of effete uh, metropolitan intellectual who's never sort of wrung a hen's neck and never sort of cut the throat of a, of a calf where these guys do it every day so again there's that conflict he doesn't like them and he doesn't like uh, his Lebanese uh, um, confrere who sort of is basically hauls his way around Germany. So God is love, Islam is love, and yet he doesn't like these other <laughs> Muslims because they're not, in his mind, they're not as pure as, as he is. Um, so again, there's there's this conflict. So all these things gradually build up and build up and build up and sort of turn and turn and turn him. Um and the other thing is he, in real life, he was an architectural, an engineering student. And there's a lot in the in the book about his attitude towards modernist architecture. So the Twin Towers themselves were for him, as well as obviously Bin Laden, the perfect target because of their sort of boasting, you know, we are the tallest building in, in America, in, in New York. It's almost like a siren demanding to be to be raised. Um, he talks about uh, uh, the last sort of Le Corbusier, uh, Le Corbusier uh, development in St. Louis, um, which lasted about 30 years before it was raised to the ground because it was just it was just so sort of antisocial in its sort of space that it you know its inhabitants just it became a focus of crime and, and graffiti and vandalism and all that sort of thing. And he, he revels in the fact that this was pulled down because it just shows that, as he says, that people cannot live in somebody else's art because the architect of that, it was uh, an act of art for him. But the reality, the practicalities of it, people were asked to live in a work of art and they they rejected it wholeheartedly. And he's triumphant and exultant in this. When he's a student at Hamburg, he goes on a field trip to Aleppo in Syria. It's one of the oldest cities in, 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 in the Middle East. And, um, you know, it's it's sort of an organic city. It, to him, it's an Islamic city with souks and, and, and everything. And he feels that's how they should be. And the problem is, is that it's being sort of um, redeveloped um, with sort of grid grid system and uh, highways for, for the cars and stuff, which to him is abomination. You know, it should be left to its natural, more organic development, not this sort of, as again, as he sees it, Western imperialist uh, modality. Um, so all these things, and as I say, you know, I have a lot of sympathy with some of with quite a lot of this thinking, Disney, architecture, all that sort of stuff. But 
But it's that sort of fear of the body, his own body, which his father has sort of implanted in him, and fear of women, obviously, in particular, uh, that, that just pushes him out there. It's interesting that when he meets Bin Laden in the book, at first he's suspicious of him because he thinks... I think this guy is in it for him. You know, yes, he's using the sort of the, the cause of Islam, but he's he's in it for himself. He he wants to make himself the the caliph of a sort of a, an Islamic an Islamic state. Don't forget, this all predates IS and all that theory, which took on Bin Laden and moved it on again to these ideas of the caliphate. Um, so he's suspicious of Bin Laden. Doesn't you know? Bin Laden isn't even pure enough for him. Um, also, Bin Laden is a Saudi. Um, so that that is problematical. Um, but I don't know if this ever happened this next event. But then Bin Laden gets up. You know, they've been sitting down having a meeting. And Bin Laden gets up and says, let's play a game of sport to sort of test your resolve and your stamina. And, and Atta thinks, what the hell is this, sport? You know, how decadent is sport? Why are you playing sport? And he realises that, you know, when Bin Laden stands up, he's about six foot two. He's a giant of a man. Uh, in the same way as Kafka's dad was a giant of a man. And uh, they play volleyball. Volleyball is the chosen sport. Of course, Bin Laden has this huge height advantage over the other three players and wins game after game after game, sort of drives him into the ground, really. Um, so, he's, again, he sort of returned to the position of his father, that his father put him in, and this sort of humiliation and this disgrace and, and shame. And of course, he hates Bin Laden for doing that to him, and and you know for making him play a game of sport. Um, but of course, he's absolutely loyal to the plan and and and, and all of that. He's he they have to take an oath to Bin Laden, and they've done that before they play the game, as one of his uh, co-conspirators points out. You know, too late, mate. <laughs> you can't go back on it. So, I just think this is a, a brilliant jigsaw, piece by piece, slow drip of of a, a psyche being pushed to its extremes until it, eventually it snaps. And there's, there's, there's two bits in here I just, I just want to read because I said it was research heavy, which it is, but it's why it's so successful is because it's not just a dry sort of, you know, it's the research is embedded in some fantastic language, amazing language. So as an example of that, this is one of the most chilling things I think I've ever read. So they're in the plane, they're, they're, they're at the point of kid, of hijacking it and um, they've got into the cockpit. So they've killed the co-pilot and now they've got the pilot in their hands. And the pilot says, and this is where I'm going to start quoting from, please beg the pilot in English, I have a wife, I have daughters. And Atta's response in thought is, why does he brag about a life that is impossible? Why should the act of reproduction stay my hand? Should his genitals keep me from murder? The commingling of skin upon skin? The flesh? And then he stabs him. And and that is what it, you know, ultimately what it comes down to. It's the body. It's the, the you know, the white guy's, you know, his race, his ethnicity sort of condemns him. Being American and being anti-Muslim, that's the perception he has in his head. But actually, it's it's more than that. It's an absolute repulsion at, the, at flesh, at his own and that of others, and anything to do with sexuality, and and that's just a sort of, and and he he um, he wipes out the flesh. He stabs the guy to death. It's the first person he's ever killed. First thing he's ever killed. And then the other bit I want to do is just where he brings together succinctly all the reasons behind Atta's makeup, his hatreds and his prejudices, and one of his co-conspirators' uh, view on all of that. So, um, he, you know, this co-conspirator is someone who hauls himself, or, you know, uh, you know, all things, all flesh pots to him. But why are you here, I ask, you who are subject to the whims of uncontrollable passion? I am uncomplicated, Amir, he says. I'm not motivated by politics. I don't hate Jews. I'm not afraid of women. I'm not a Saudi without a future, he says. You should not forbid yourself the excesses of this strange world. You would know that cocaine and alcohol are the same thing. And expensive cars and luxury hotels are the same. And love of a woman is the same. And so too is jihad. It's all drugs, brother. And I'm an addict. It's very simple, Amir. I like being high. So they're all of these things that, that 
that uh, Atta has sort of forbidden himself and and denied himself. These other guys were living it, and again, if you you know some of the uh, the sort of the atrocities in Europe recently have been carried out by people who are petty criminals. People have not denied themselves these vices, sex and drugs and, and theft and, and, and all of that. But it, but for whatever reason, they then seek to sort of purge themselves clean through this one act of dedication to God. It's, so, it's like a murderous version of sort of um, seeking absolution on the Catholic deathbed. Only these guys do it through an act rather than a, a, a sort of a verbal commitment. And there, all the elements are in place. You know, it's, it's you know, I'm not political. You know, I don't see Islam as political, which obviously is a major stream of, of sort of uh, fundamentalism, Islam. I don't hate Jews. Well, Atta is, is virulently anti-Semitic throughout this book. And it's so sort of casual and, you know, every conspiracy theory going, uh, he buys. Um, I'm not afraid of women. Well, Atta is absolutely afraid of women. I'm not a Saudi without a future, i.e. Uh, the people at the bottom of society in Saudi Arabia who just, you know, have, see they have no uh, nothing to lose. Um, and obviously Atta isn't that, because Atta's from a middle-class background. Um, and I, I just think this is a, a fantastic read, a really, really clever, uh, perceptive book. As I say, ultimately, we're, you know, it is a work of fiction. So ultimately, we never know whether how much of it is true to the, to Muhammad Atta, but it's it doesn't matter because this book stands alone uh, in a treatment of that subject matter. In a way, I wish I'd written it, but I I never could have written it because I don't come from a, that sort of cultural background of Egypt and and Islamic and and all of that. But that's how good it is. It's just so authentic. So I'm going to read um, some of his other stuff, which sounds very different. Um, he said, you know, I don't know much about him, but he seems to have lots of fingers in lots of pies. He was in New York during the, the, the sort of party scene. Uh, he seemed to have a background in gaming or at least tuned into that world. One of his first books is on, on a sort of small period of sort of gaming no, notorious history. So uh, he seems a very interesting writer, uh, which uh, um, means that the recommendation of Ian Sinclair and Stuart Lee has been upheld. OK, so um, I'll be back with just one more before Christmas, which will be my best and worst of 2017, uh, which this right at the end of the year has.